Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's program. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. Um, all of our participants today are on mute, but we would like for this presentation to be as informative as possible. If you have questions for our panelists, please share them via the Q&A box on your screens. Please note, we may not have time for questions today as we have a lot of ground to cover and hopefully we'll answer most of your questions during our presentation. However, our speakers will be following up after the program to make sure that they can answer any of your questions. As a reminder, this program is being recorded today and will be posted on our website in three business days. Now I will pass it on to Rich Gold. Thanks, gang, and thanks for joining us today. We've got a great panel for you on the Inflation Reduction Act and, and the sum and substance here. Obviously, um, the bill itself follows an incredibly productive uh, session and really two sessions of Congress passing not only the CHIPS bill uh, in July, but also the infrastructure bill and all of the COVID relief um, that happened in this Congress as well. So a very productive time. But the thing that I just wanted to focus on for folks for a minute is to um, focus on really how those, those three bills, the infrastructure bill, the CHIPS bill, and the Inflation Reduction Act collectively represent a change in the government private sector partnership that really for the next, uh, next decade is going to redirect um, how things, major infrastructure, major projects in this country, transformational technology get done. So the era of um, sort of all regulation forcing things or the private sector um, moving based on market incentives uh, alone um, is now phasing into an era where government and private sector partnerships working together and government financing on um, major infrastructure and energy and clean tech projects is going to be uh, more aligned really with how Europe and much of the rest of the world has made change in these spaces for uh, a long time. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. That new paradigm or that paradigm shift um, in government private sector partnership um, and government being at all levels. So while we're here today to talk about federal government partnerships through DOE and Treasury, et cetera, obviously a lot of states um, with perhaps California leading uh, are already down this path and we expect to see more collaboration and cooperation at the state and federal level with the private sector moving forward. Um, so I'm joined today by Beth Viola, who um, is a former Clinton administration uh, official like myself, working at CEQ with Katie McGinty for Vice President Gore and President Clinton, um, a senior policy advisor here at Holland and & Knight and co-lead of our energy and natural resources uh, industry sector group. Nicole Elliott, uh, a partner in um, our tax practice, um, who along with Josh Odins, uh, who has a little bit more fur on his face than he does in his photo there, um, was key in uh, both playing offense and helping to do a lot of drafting on this bill, um, as well as playing defense. So for those of you out in corporate America who aren't dealing with 163N or some of the international tax components right now, I know I wake up every morning and thank Josh and Nicole for that. Uh, so next slide, please. So we're going to go through, um, you know, a general overview of the bill. And I will say this is, you know, much as we did when we went through the infrastructure bill about a year ago or whatever, nine months ago, this is a very comprehensive piece of legislation with a lot of different funding opportunities, both uh, contained in the tax code as well as direct payment through um, federal agencies. So we're gonna go over um, sort of the umbrella picture first, go through uh, direct funding and then tax and tax incentives and talk a little bit about implementation here, which obviously um, we're in full gear on in the infrastructure bill already. And, and we definitely had some clean tech and energy programs in there that'll be important that were complemented by IRA. 
um, but we're just starting to see implementation, for instance, um, uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks um, out of DOE on IRA. So next slides, please. Okay, I think I'm handing off here. You are indeed. Thank you, Rich. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to join you today. Um, I wanted to um, touch base a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act and climate and energy provisions, because so much of this bill is focused on energy, but also focused on how to reduce emissions. I think it's important to remember that um, when President Biden ran for president um, in 2000, he he ran on a platform of building back better. Um, and for those of you who remember that IRA was originally called the Build Back Better legislation, but the plan was he ran on a platform of how to invest in our nation's infrastructure um, in a way that allows us to build back our infrastructure that create in a way that creates really good high paying jobs, but also allows us to um, make investments to transition to a low carbon economy. Um, the IRA is a tremendous down payment on the president's objective um, and a, a presidential platform. I think this matters for a number of reasons. First of all, this bill is provides unprecedented amounts of money, $369 billion. And of that, $147 billion of it are in direct spending. And I'm gonna talk about some of those direct spending highlights in a minute. This bill also fundamentally revises the tax code um, to greater incentivize carbon reductions. And by that, we go from taking some of the more traditional tax incentives and some of the new tax incentive programs, but we transition them over the next few years into a technology neutral approach, which also um, in this instance gives a longer runway to make the transition to a low carbon economy. So on many of these tax incentives, as those of you who have been working on tax energy tax policy for a long time, recognize that energy tax has often been subject to the two-year extender process. And so for the first time, we are talking about a runway that allows, in many instances, almost 10 years for companies to really make those investments and to plan for um, deploying clean energy technology. Throughout this whole bill, you will hear a number of themes as we go through, but there are a lot of pieces that are really important here, which is including the environmental justice component. In this bill, along with the Infrastructure Act and others, all of the money needs to, 40% of the monies need to be spent in low income or disadvantaged communities. So ensuring that no community is left behind. There's also a significant com component that includes making sure prevailing wages are paid on all of these in all of these programs or tax incentives. So the president said we were going to create good paying jobs, and this bill certainly does allow for the creation of that. There's also the issue of onshoring um, our supply chain. We have had a lot of challenges. We are for the first time moving towards, I think even post COVID, a lot of challenges with our supply chain. And so we have been moving into a place where we are incentivizing manufacturing, um, the extraction of minerals, um, but how do we build it here and how do we produce it here? And I think you'll hear that in a lot of the programs that we're gonna talk about today. And then most importantly, reducing emissions. Um, you know. This bill is supposed to anticipates reducing carbon dioxide emissions 40% by 2030, which is a pretty significant chunk of emissions. So not only does it allow the US to like address its climate goals, but it really allows the United States to reclaim its position as a leader on climate change on the global stage. Next slide. I think the key here is that the amount of money we're talking about here, $369 billion, all is complementary. The legislation in the IRA is complementary to the other three bills that are listed here. You know, the Energy Policy Act that passed in December of 2020 created, an, uh, created new authority and a number of programs to advance energy deployment, clean energy deployment primarily in the United States. Um, and so the IRA also provides funding for a number of those programs that were created under the Energy Policy Act. 
also the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, IIJA, um, that, that bill provided a lot of money for onshoring manufacturing, the creation of things like hydrogen hubs, the new creation of the Office of Clean Energy uh, demonstrations. And in that bill, that was $62 billion just to the Department of Energy. So you are talking about huge amounts of money just to the Department of Energy between these two bills. And then, of course, the CHIPS bill that just recently passed right before the uh, Inflation Reduction Act this summer. And that provides $50 billion worth of money to the Department of Commerce to take to build out our semiconductor industry here in the United States. These things all go hand in hand, and the government, for the first time, is running a coordinated effort to ensure these funds are being spent thoughtfully um, and are being coordinated at the highest levels with the recent executive order that we saw last week and with the appointment of um, John Podesta overseeing that effort. Next slide. Um, so this is a good chart that we had um, produced as part of the summary that you can find on our website, but this has, this breaks down the $147 billion in direct funding by agency. Um, as you can see, the Department of Agriculture, DOE, and EPA lead the chart here. Next slide. These, I wanted to just take a little bit to talk about some of the highlights of how those monies are going to be spent um, as part of um, the IRA, and, um, and then we'll switch over to the tax side. But first of all, with EPA, there is $41.5 billion, which is unprecedented amounts of money for that agency. Um, and I wanted to ish, I wanted to mention two issues that I think are really important uh, in terms of the funding that are going to that agency. One is the creation of the new Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which provides $27 billion um, to help deploy low and zero carbon emissions technology. So essentially a green energy bank, if you will, out of the, out of the Department of Energy. Um, but the other piece that I think is really important to note about the Environmental Protection Agency money is that they are going to put a price on methane emissions as part of this legislation, which is the first time that EPA will directly levy um, fees on industry and on emitters um, related to climate change. Um, and so the first time we'll see a methane fee. But in conjunction with that is the um, fact that the agency has $1.5 billion um, that they're going to provide in incentives for the deployment of methane reduction technologies. So while they plan to provide this um, fee or implement this fee, they will provide some funding for, for deployment of technologies in advance. Um, the Department of Energy has $35.2 billion, and across the Department of Energy, um, that money is meant to expand investments in domestic manufacturing, industrial emissions reduction, um, energy infrastructure, um, in addition to clean ener energy research deployment, uh, development and deployment. Um, and a lot of that money goes hand in hand with the money that I referenced in the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. It also provides almost $10 billion um, for building efficiency programs. So that's a lot of money for just looking at the built environment um, and its carbon footprint. Um, and then I think another really important component of the Department of Energy is that increases commitment authority for many of the agency's loan programs. So leveraging federal resources um, as a multiplier for clean energy financing. And then just really quickly, I'm going to mention DOI has $6 billion, a little more than $6 billion. And while I've said there is a significant um, focus on clean energy investments, I do want to make sure people appreciate that there was a little bit of a level set here in terms of addressing energy security and providing an all of the above strategy in this bill. Um, so the IRA did provide a number, include a number of provisions to support conventional energy deployment development in the United States. And that piece is primarily reflected in the Department of Interior title. Um, in this place, the title ties together traditional and renewable energy development 
and guarantees onshore and offshore leasing development um, for both sectors. So regardless of who's in charge and who wants to see more conventional or more renewable energy deployment, the reality is they are now tied to go hand in hand. So for instance, offshore wind and offshore oil and gas development will go hand in hand. Um, the one other piece that's really a note, though, in terms of this title is that the um, IRA does raise royalties on natural resource extraction, um, including a new royalty for methane extraction, um, which also includes venting and flaring. Um, the Department of Defense got uh, just $500 million in this title, but essentially $500 million to accelerate um, and support the president's um, invocation of the Defense Production Act um, to accelerate def domestic manufacturing. So a lot of work around domestic manufacturing as it relates to clean energy and all of the resources we need to uh, deploy energy here in the United States. And then last but not least is the uh, Department of Agriculture, which comes in at the top uh, of the chart with 46.68 billion dollars, um, which is the most money in the IRA. Um, and a lot of this looks at natural resources uh, as a carbon uh, opportunity to address carbon mitigation. Um, so $20 billion to the Natural Resources Conservation Service to invest in conservation programs. Um, equally important is funding for forestry programs to address wildlife risk uh, and mitigate carbon through natural solutions and another $10 billion to rural cooperatives to access and deploy renewable energy. Um, I think one last thing I wanna note is that, as I said, the agencies are all working collaboratively to try to get this money out. And um, we have been working closely with the White House and the agencies as they are starting to um, put together their plans to deploy some of these dollars. So with that, let me turn it over to Josh Odens. Hey, thanks, Beth. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes discussing two of the three major tax offsets that are part of the IRA. So if you'd asked me a year ago during the Build Back Better era before it became the IRA, if this book tax would become law and guilty would not become law, I would have laughed because the administration's priority back in 2021 and even into 2022 was to make changes to the global and tangible low tax income regime to align the U.S. with what was proposed at the OECD. Instead, we don't have changes to guilty and most of the other revenue raisers from Build Back Better were eliminated. Instead, we have the book tax, stock repurchase tax, excise tax, and IRS funding. I'll cover the first two. So let's start with the book tax. This was a proposal that in concept came from Senator Warren and uh, at the time candidate Biden during their campaigns. Uh, it eventually this proposal in a different form was included as part of the administration's budget. Um, the goal of this tax is to impose a 15% uh, minimum tax based on financial statement income. Um, so, and it's a tax, not just on the US, but it looks at the global income of a group. This is really an apples to oranges alternative minimum tax. Um, so for example, a publicly traded company corporation prepares two sets of books and records, one for financial statements that go to shareholders and the other, and then it's called book tax. And then the other is for the IRS, which is we refer to as cash tax. And there are huge differences between the two. So one, book tax is regulated by PCAOB uh, and, um, and the accountants interpret those rules. Um, the cash tax rules are provided by Congress and implemented and interpreted by Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service. And there are big differences between the two. So for example, appreciation. Uh, cash tax currently has current expensing for property under a certain period of, uh, that could be recovered under a certain period of years. So 15 year property and, and, uh, and other property can be immediately expensed. Whereas 
book depreciation doesn't care about current expensing in the tax code. It uses the financial accounting for the life of that asset. And so that could lead to significant differences between cash and book tax. Um, there are also permanent differences, and we'll cover a few of those in a second. This is a provision that raises roughly $222 billion over 10 years, but applies to a very limited number of corporations. Even though it applies to a small number of corporations, I think it's under 250 or 300 is what was, um, what was stated by Congress. Uh, any taxpayer that is potentially in scope will have to calculate this AMT, very similar to uh, the old corporate AMT or individual AMT. And that's to demonstrate that either the tax applies and a certain amount is owed or the tax doesn't apply. In any event, lots of corporations will have to deal with this tax. Um, the tax applies to corporations with adjusted financial statement income of greater than $1 billion. And that's measured over a three-year period. For foreign corporations that do business in the United States, uh, they also have to satisfy another hurdle, which is that the U.S. income, adjusted financial statement income, must exceed $100 million. And so how do you get to AFSI? Well, you first have to start with an applicable financial statement. And the Internal Revenue Code has a pecking order for what is an applicable financial statement. Um, and that includes starting with one, a 10K or something provided to shareholders via the SEC. Uh, so that is the starting point. If a taxpayer doesn't have that type of a document, then it goes to the next in order. Uh, and, so, uh, and so we're looking forward to Treasury uh, providing clarity that it's gonna follow uh, what is in, a, in other statutes in the Internal Revenue Code. Then the, uh, the corporation has to make various adjustments to its applicable financial statement to arrive at AFSI. Uh, the first is it includes its pro rata share of all income or losses of its controlled foreign corporations. Uh, so it doesn't care if the income is passive income or guilty income or even exempt all the income is included and losses as well. And if there's an overall loss, that loss cannot offset US income, but it can be carried forward, which is more beneficial than the current guilty system. Um, it's also important to note that uh, there is a, uh, an exemption uh, or QBI uh, for the regular return on assets, so the, the non the deemed non-intangible return is exempt from tax under regular principles, but under the AMT, that income that is otherwise exempt is subject to tax, potentially. There's also, there are also some good adjustments. So accelerated depreciation uh, is a good adjustment. That means taxpayers who enjoy accelerated depreciation who are asset uh, you know, in manufacturing and uh, they will get to enjoy the benefits of accelerated depreciation without having to pay the AMT potentially. Partnerships, uh, the taxpayer, a corporation has to take into income its distributive share from partnerships. A little more about that in a second. There are a variety of adjustments for pensions. Um, and it's important to note that those corporations that uh, manufacture a lot in the United States and export, um, will not be able to get that benefit uh, or will not be able to get the benefit for foreign derived and tangible income. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, there are a few additional key features that are worth noting. Um, on the good side, foreign tax credits uh, paid by a CFC can be fully cross credited. So high tax and low tax income um, can blend, um, which should reduce or potentially help reduce the, the bite of the AMT. And then there's also a limitation uh, on the foreign tax credits that can be used. It's 15% of CFC income. There's also a benefit for those foreign taxes paid directly by a U.S. corporation or by a foreign branch of a U.S. corporation. Uh, those taxes are not subject to a limit. So there could be a planning opportunity 
to check the box on a foreign corporation and have those taxes directly uh, pay, viewed as paid by the U.S. corporation. Um, general business credit. So some of the credits that we're going to discuss in a few minutes with Nicole, um, those credits can help offset the AMP uh, up to 75%. And then there's a limitation on NOLs. Um, post-2019 net operating losses can offset up to 80% of adjusted financial statement income. It's important to note that pre-2020 NOLs are permanently lost. I think that is a very harsh um, and unfortunate rule that will hurt companies that were startups and um, or went through difficult periods in the late, um, in late teens. Those NOLs will be permanently lost. There are a lot of issues Treasury will have to address, including how are reorganizations affected by the, the AMT? Uh, and already we're seeing comment letters uh, to that effect. Um, what about taxpayers with multiple uh, consolidated groups or multiple U.S. taxpayers? Um, the applicable financial statement will need to be divided up, and Treasury will have to provide guidance on methodologies that are permissible to do so. Treasury will have a lot of pressure on exercising its authority. It has very broad authority to issue regulations that are um, consistent with the purpose of the statute. Um, however, there is no legislative history for this section. Um, this provision was not marked up in ways and means, and there's no committee report on the book tax. So it is, uh, it is really up to Treasury to interpret what is meant by this tax. And then finally, the partnership provisions. Um, there are cryptic lines about Treasury getting authority to address partnerships, but it will be up to Treasury to create a whole new regime to address partnerships and how partnership income should be divided. So let's go to the next uh, offset. Very quickly, we'll cover the, um, the excise tax on the repurchase of corporate stock. This is a provision that received a lot less attention. It was also a provision that was not marked up in committee. And so we don't have legislative history. Um, it raises about $74 billion over 10 years. And it's a 1% excise tax on the net of stock repurchased by a covered corporation after December 31st, 2022. So this tax doesn't apply right now. So I would expect to, you know, if companies were concerned about the excise tax, um, they could uh, enter into stock repurchases during the last quarter of the year without this excise tax applying. The tax only applies to covered corporations, which are domestic corporations. Stock is traded on an established securities market, basically publicly traded uh, corporations. And it only applies on the net fair market value of repurchases over issuances. Um, so, um, so companies manage their earnings profits and manage their uh, earnings per share in a variety of ways. And so, uh, sometimes a corporation will repurchase stock, uh, but also issue to a different group. And so those two get to net out, which does leave a question, uh, how is the tax going to be administered? Is it going to be administered on a uh, periodic basis where a corporation has to pay some of the excise tax and then hope for a refund later on? Or is it going to be netted out at the end of the year? And that will be up to Treasury to let us know in guidance. The, there are, um, uh, so a repurchase for purposes of this tax is defined as a redemption under the code and in any other transaction that Treasury defines as economically similar. Uh, there is, are some exceptions uh, or I issues that, that should be, that people should be aware of. The first is that corporations that invert or change their corporate domicile as defined by 7874, after September 20th, 21st are treated as domestic corporations and the, if any repurchases they engage in will be treated the same as a domestic corporation. And then corporate reorganizations, if, um, if there is boot or a taxable piece of a corporate reorganization, um, then apparently the, the uh, repurchase uh, is, subject to, uh, is subject to the excise tax. I think the better reading of the rule is that to the extent there is boot, 
that section, that portion of the repurchase is subject to the excise tax, but the tax-free piece under the reorganization rules should not be subject to the excise tax. But we'll once again have to see how Treasury interprets that provision. And then finally, uh, we're already seeing uh, some concern among SPACs, which are incorporating pocketbooks that uh, enter into acquisitions, um, that this rule could have a negative implication uh, for SPACs. Um, but we uh, will have to see what other issues Treasury decides it needs to address, and uh, and we'll, we'll let Rich cover that in, in a little bit. So if I could turn to Nicole, that's just a thumbnail sketch of the uh, of the revenue raisers. So let's talk about the good provisions in the in the code. Thanks, Josh. So yeah, let's talk about all the goodies now that we have all of your bad news about tax revenue raisers in the IRA. And I would say that given kind of our time constraints here, I'm going to focus on tax incentives as they relate to businesses. The IRA did contain a host of incentives available to individuals and families that you should be aware of. So if you're like me and you need a new car and you're thinking about that new electric vehicle, even a previously owned electric vehicle, or thinking about making improvements to your home to make it more energy efficient, Certainly now is the time to be starting to think about that, um, but we simply don't have time today to cover all of those individual tax incentives. I also wanna caveat that we're not gonna be able to walk through each and every tax credit that was included in the IRA. Um, I'm not even gonna have time to kind of walk you through each credit and say, what makes you eligible? What is the amount of the credit? Uh, and the effective date, I would say, however, and urge you to the extent you are interested to go to the Holland and Knight website. And on that website, right on the front page, we have a link that uh, to a client alert that covers all of the information that we presented here today in greater detail. So it does break down every single credit and goes through the eligibility criteria. For example, it covers the stuff uh, the material that Josh and Beth also talked about. And to answer a question that I am seeing pop up here on our chat, uh, these, this PowerPoint presentation will be posted to our website as well, along with a recording uh, of the webinar. So now that I've kind of told you everything I'm not going to talk about. Uh, let's figure out what I what I am going to talk about. Um, and I would say what I what I the, the, the IRA really provided a historic boost to renewable energy and climate. And it does that through the tax code, which of course makes us tax attorneys very, very excited. And I thought what would be most helpful is kind of walk you through the big picture observation and themes that we see in the tax incentives. And I'm gonna focus first on the tax credits in the IRA. The first thing that I want to illustrate with, for you with these slides is just the breadth uh, of the categories that they fall in. And in my mind, all of the tax credits in the IRA fall in sort of one in five categories. And you could disagree with my categorization here. But for me, they are really about energy generation, which is about producing energy from renewable sources, clean fuels. Next slide, please manufacturing, clean vehicles, and finally carbon sequestration. And you'll see in each of these five categories, I've listed the tax credits that fall under those categories. And I've added the name. Um, and for, because we always, we aren't always very clear sometimes when we use the name, we're not particular, some of us are not uh, very good about using the technical name. I've also included the section codes. And those are of course, sections of the Internal Revenue Code found in Title 26. And if you're paying super close attention, I do have an asterisk on one of these. Uh, I've noted where they're new. I should say that as well. So the IRA really included old credits that were used to, and it included them by extending them, modifying, enhancing them. But the IRA also contains some very totally new tax credits that will be available. And I have that asterisk here on 48D because I don't wanna get any emails that my presentation was incorrect. 48D actually came in through the CHIPS Act and it was one of the bills that 
Beth mentioned. And I included it here just because I feel like it's it fits. It is about investing in the semiconductor space. Next slide, please. So let me just share with you some of my observations. As Beth suggested, this is a really significant investment in terms of money. Here, I've created a pie chart for you covering those five categories to give you a sense of kind of where they fall. In total, although Beth mentioned the $360 billion in the IRA, the tax credits amount to about $250 billion. The leader there is energy generation at $157 billion, followed by manufacturing at $61 billion. So the observation is that there's a lot of new credits. That should now be obvious from looking at my slides and a lot to dive in here um, if you are in this space. The second observation I have is that this is really holistic. So not only are we caring about, for example, energy generation, generation from renewable sources, but we're caring about and incentivizing how we get there. So there is a significant, um, very historic set of tax credits now focused on manufacturing, focused on how we get there, whether it's through incentivizing solar components, wind components, all those things we need uh, to get to our final goal. As Beth mentioned, also very exciting is that these credits have a long runway. They're effective for a long time. No longer are we going to be in this situation where Congress would extend a tax credit, maybe for one year, maybe for two years, maybe Congress would let it lapse and then reinstate it, which would, of course, as you can imagine, create instability and uncertainty. And here now we have these tax credits, which are effective for a long period of time. As Beth also mentioned, what we see is a transition to technology neutral across the board in the IRA. So while the production tax credit, which has been in the code for a long time, was focused on energy production from, for example, solar or wind, that is the statute identified sources, we will transition in 2025 to a technology neutral production tax credit, meaning that Congress didn't care how you got there. It didn't specify how you had to get there in terms of solar, wind, or other technology, but what it cared about was, are you creating green, are you creating energy without creating greenhouse gases? So it's a very transition to a very goal-centered tax credit. And it's really agnostic to the technology, which I think is very welcome. Finally, this IRA and the tax incentives in it are very focused on all things USA. Um, one way that kind of manifests itself is through domestic content rules, which we'll talk about in a minute. But throughout, you see requirements, for example, to manufacture something in the United States and not import it from a foreign entity of concern or produce it in the United States. Again, an overall observation of the tax incentives in the IRA. Next slide, please. So those were just some observations. And I wanted to also spend the rest of my time talking about some of the themes and by themes, I really mean those rules or provisions that we see throughout the tax credits in the IRA. They are applicable, maybe not to all, and I'll kind of walk you through which ones they are or which ones they aren't applicable to. But generally speaking, there are themes that and provisions that we see in most, if not all of the tax credits that were included. Next slide, please. So the first and perhaps most important theme is monetization, the ability to monetize these new or extended tax credits. So tax credits, as you may be aware, are used to offset the tax liability of the taxpayer. Uh, that's all great if you are a taxpayer who has sufficient tax liability, but there could be reasons where you are a taxpayer who has little or no income tax liability, making going out and getting these credits not particularly um, interesting. The IRA changed the game by creating provisions for direct pay and the transferability of these tax credits. 
The first one I wanted to talk about is direct pay, what the, what the industry has referred to, we've kind of coined direct pay. And that is really the ability for certain taxpayers to ask the IRS for a check. Um, and while we will certainly await guidance, and so I'm oversimplifying it a little bit by saying, go ask the IRS for a check, that is really how mechanically direct pay works. It is available only to certain applicable entities. So it's namely those entities that are not subject to federal income taxation. So tax exempt entities, state or political subdivisions, the Tennessee Valley Authority or Native American tribes can elect for the direct payment of most tax credits that are in the IRA. I should say there are about 12 that are available for this treatment. So this really opens up the field to those, again, who wouldn't necessarily perhaps be pursuing these tax credits because now they can go ask the IRS for a check in the amount of the tax credit to which they are entitled. This means that because of kind of who it limits the playing field to, namely only applicable entities, for-profit entities generally don't have the ability to ask for a check. They don't generally have the ability to seek direct payment of these credits. There are three exceptions for three credits. And that is that are those credits that I've listed on the slide, 45Q, 45X, and 45V. 45Q, of course, about carbon oxide sequestration. 45X is a new manufacturing production credit when you are making components related to renewable energy. And 45V, which is about producing energy from clean hydrogen. For those three credits for a limited time, for-profit entities can seek direct payment. That is, they can seek direct payment from the IRS for the credit. I should note again that this, this really is a section where we will need Treasury and IRS guidance, and it is not effective until next year. So we do have some time, but certainly something to think about. Next slide, please. So we talked about monetization of these credits in the form of direct pay. The other alternative most available to for-profit entities, and in fact, tax exempt entities cannot take advantage of this, is the ability to sell these tax credits. Um, the statute allows for the ability for, to transfer most of these credits for cash. In fact, the statute requires the transfer to be for cash. And also in that instance, the statute clarifies that that income received from the sale is not subject to income tax and it cannot be deducted by the payor. So in my mind, and you can see, uh, there's certainly been some writings about how this changes or doesn't change the game according to some, but I personally feel that the transferability of these credits is a game changer. We will, of course, need to gain some experience and some guidance from Treasury and IRS on how this will all work. But, you know, traditionally what we have done when a taxpayer is entitled to a credit but does has little to no tax liability is enter into the tax equity market. And you may have heard that term. And that tax equity market was working, but some considered it very inefficient. And so I think that the more simple transferability through, for example, just the contract sale of these tax credits will prove important uh, in the IRA. Next slide, please. Beth mentioned the focus on giving everyone a good paying job. And in the tax incentive world, and particularly the tax credit world, how this was accomplished was by setting forth prevailing wage and apprenticeship rules. I would not, they are not requirements. So the way that these, when these prevailing wage and apprenticeship rules come into play is that throughout the IRA, is that they are, these credits are established at a base rate. So a lower base amount in terms of their value. And although prevailing wage and apprenticeship is not mandatory to get that base rate, it's a sweetener. Generally speaking, if you meet the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, 
it's a sweetener of your tax credit multiplied by five. So I think it's significant enough that taxpayers will be aiming to meet the prevailing wage and apprenticeship rules. I would also say the way that I read the statute, it's really, these, these rules are really not about gotchas. They're not about footfalls. And I say that because there are corrections. There is the ability to correct your mistakes. For example, in the prevailing wage world, if you realize that you have paid a laborer less than prevailing wage, you can make that person whole and pay a penalty to the Department of Treasury. Um, and there are also in the apprenticeship in particular, some good faith. If there aren't apprentices available for the work, um, you know, some outs, so to speak, in meeting those requirements. There are also exceptions of the prevailing wage and apprenticeship rules, such that small projects, and importantly, those beginning construction prior to 60 days after guidance, that might take a little unpacking. But basically, in a in I think, although the prevailing wage and apprenticeship was a big win for labor in the IRA, there was a recognition that getting to getting to meet these would require some some leeway and some runway. So throughout the IRA, the the rule on meeting this is that the IRS and Treasury shall issue guidance on what this all means. Plus 60 days is really when we need to be watching the prevailing wage and apprenticeship. Prior to that 60 day sort of safe harbor, projects are generally deemed to meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship. So it's somewhat of a forgiving rule. Um, and I should say, many of you are probably already familiar with at least the prevailing wage provisions. The prevailing wage in the IRA is built off of the Davis Bacon Act, which is a law since 1931. Um, and generally was is generally applicable when you're entering into a federal contract with the federal government. Davis Bacon, since its enactment, has been extended and, and its applicability applicability extended many times thereover when federal dollars are involved. So the federal government may not be a party to the contract, but there's been a grant or a loan or insurance from the federal government, and therefore Davis Bacon wages have to be used. And basically under Davis-Bacon, the Department of Labor issues, and you can go on sam.gov to see these wages for every locality, for example, the District of Columbia, the Department of Labor has issued guidance on what the prevailing wage is based on what type of worker. So construction worker, and then within that, there are kind of subcategories. And so again, to hit this bonus credit for many of these tax incentives, you will want to be watching prevailing wage and making sure that you have met that. Similarly, apprenticeship, it's, uh, that is, I think, certainly one where we'll also be waiting Treasury and IRS guidance. The way that that works is you're supposed to look at all of your total labor hours and you're meeting a percentage that was uh, performed by qualified apprentices. And it's a percentage that increases over time. So again, that is a very big theme in the IRA. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the very focus on USA, everything uh, trying to incentivize the onshoring, trying to eliminate uh, dependency on foreign uh, things for our energy independence. And the one additional way that they do this is through domestic content rules. Again, these are not requirements. They're not domestic content requirements. They are like the prevailing wage and apprenticeship sweeteners. So if you meet the domestic content rules, you can be eligible for an additional generally 10% credit on top of your base, your bonus for prevailing wage and now domestic content. I would say domestic content is applicable to a much narrower scope in terms of the tax credits it applies to. Um, and to meet the domestic content, you are looking about looking at where your steel, where your iron came from in your completed facility, and you're looking at the manufactured products which are contained in that facility. And like the apprenticeship rules, you've got to hit a percentage to certify that you've met the domestic content rules. Next level, please. Next slide. 
finally, in terms of tax credits, another theme that Beth suggested was one about equity and making sure there were no communities left behind. And the way that the IRA does this in the tax credit world is that it gives another bonus if you are placing a facility in an energy community or a low income communities. And there are various rules for how we kind of draw those lines. But again, only eligible for a certain limited number of tax credits in the IRA, namely the production tax credit and its successor, the technology neutral production tax credit and the investment tax credit and its successor, the technology neutral investment tax credit is where these apply. And I should say, if you're thinking about all of these bonuses um, and if you're thinking about how high you can get, the answer is pretty high. If you get the base, you meet the prevailing wage bonus, you meet the domestic content, and you meet the energy or low-income community, you're talking about a tax credit that has grown in value quite a bit. So certainly something to think about. And I would say that this bonus, the bonuses that I'm talking about is somewhat se is, is separate. And I think of these as kind of stacking the bonuses versus the double dipping rule. So throughout the IRA, there are rules and it's, uh, it is not a, a total prohibition. There are exceptions, but for example, if you're taking advantage of the production tax credit, there is a rule that you're not taking advantage of the investment tax credit. So no, generally no double dipping on tax credits, uh, but there, as I mentioned, there are exceptions. That is the final on the tax credits part of the IRA. There is one tax deduction that I thought was worth mentioning before I turn it back to Rich. Next slide, please. So while most of the tax incentives come in the form of tax credits in the IRA, there are also tax incentives that come in the form of tax deductions. So a slightly different beast. Um, but the, inf the IRA modified section 179D, which is a tax deduction that some of you may already be familiar with. It is about making commercial buildings more energy efficient. Think about your heating, your cooling, your building envelope. And the IRA really reduced the barrier to get into this deduction and also increased the value of it. And I would note as my final thing is governments could take advantage of this previously, even though they are not subject to like state and, and local governments. Now tax exempt entities can also benefit from this deduction. It allows you to designate the deduction to a third party. So the IRA really opened up the 179D deduction to tax exempt entities who would not normally benefit. So that's just a very general overview of the tax incentives, the goodies, in the IRA. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich for our last five, five minutes. Thanks very much. And I get to uh, bat clean up here. And uh, I should say, I should have said when I started out, we are operating here on Tuesday in between International Talk Like a Pirate Day and tomorrow being Bill Murray's uh, birthday. So it's, uh, it's definitely a funny celebratory week. And if you haven't gotten it so far, um, you know, there is so much information packed into just this bill, and that doesn't even get to the fact we're here uh, on either Thursday or Friday waiting for the hydrogen hubs announcement from DOE from the infrastructure bill, um, as Beth referenced, that if you, if you put all these bills together with the CHIPS bill, um, the funding opportunities are, are pretty much limitless, both in terms of direct funding uh, and the tax code. DOE and DOT have gotten substantial resources uh, and new FTE, uh, 3,000 FTE between the two of them, I believe, for implementation. Unfortunately, um, Treasury, uh, not as many, and while the IRS is, is getting uh, a lot of new potential FTE, it's, it's not going to be focused in this area. So it'll be interesting to watch um, if there's divergence between uh, tax implementation and, and particularly, um, you know, uh, the book tax uh, and sort of how guidance is going to get out on that, all that sort of stuff um, versus the, the direct pay where DOE so far with its funding under the infrastructure bill has been pretty good as has USDA in getting money out the door. But the key here is, um, as I just mentioned, with this week being Hydrogen Hums Week, we had 
um, a lot of activity around battery facilities uh, in DOE in July. Um, almost every week between the infrastructure bill and um, IRA, we're going to be seeing major and minor grant announcements. And I think the key for most companies here uh, and most interested folks following implementation here is going to be, uh, you know, really a comprehensive review that looks at how the bill um, and really the bills um, and these new programs apply to you and your situation and what you need to be watching for. Because if you are simply waiting for things to come out, um, you are not going to have the time to get together the types of responses that are required for these grants. For instance, for the battery grants uh, in July, we were putting together multi, multi hundred page, um, you know, grant writing within the space of probably four to six weeks with very detailed corporate financial information, um, as well as sort of visioning about where um, you know, particular facilities would be going and, and sort of what they would be accomplishing. So it's going to be, um, you know, pretty fascinating to watch it all roll out. But if, if you are going to be drinking from a fire hose if you're looking at everything. Um, use the time now before things get too crazy to put your plan together for what the key programs are that matter to you. I know we've got a bunch of questions coming. Um, Steph, how do we want to deal with those? Rich, we're gonna we're gonna be following up with everyone who uh, asked okay. questions. I know um, Beth was able to answer a few. Um, you should have received written responses, but we're gonna um, get all of your questions and we'll be following up. Okay. Do we have another slide, or am I at the end here? It's just thank you. Thank you all for participating. I will say that this is um, the first program we're running. Uh, in a series of programs this fall that will cover the elections, including hearing from the National Republican Senatorial Committee um, and the Democratic Senatorial Committee and the NRCC uh, on their views on what's coming. Uh, we're going to have a panel on sort of in the room where it happened uh, on um, the Inflation Reduction Act and how it came together with key congressional staff. Um, and then we're going to have a bill, uh, a program on the chips bill as well. Um, most of you should have gotten that, but it's all up on our website as well. Uh, and we look to uh, look forward to talking to everybody as we move forward here over the coming weeks. Thanks very much for participating.